firewood alert um, <clears throat> and just uh, how we can stop those invasive species and bugs from entering our state. Uh, so this is kind of uh, the prevention efforts that the Maine Forest Service has put on uh, over the last five plus years where it's really become a hot topic issue. Um, the department and the agency has really put a effort forth to um, prevent these uh, bugs coming in. Uh, and in addition to uh, these pamphlets and these postings everywhere, We've done high speed signs on the highways at 95, 295, and also on those smaller roads coming into the state from New Hampshire. I think uh, Maine's kind of lucky where we only, you know, border one state. So um, that probably attributes to why the uh, bugs have slowly been coming across the border rather than being surrounded like Massachusetts or, or Connecticut. Um, we also don't have as much of a port um, like those other states do. So those actual bugs coming from those ships and everything else from overseas. <clears throat> so this is what we're looking for uh, for forest rangers. We're looking at these pickup beds full of wood. Uh, Sometimes they're cut and split. Sometimes they're just chunked up. Uh, the far right picture is forest ranger doing a detail at a rest area. Um, and then what we're looking for really is just people that are, are traveling north and they have visible firewood. We don't actually go and um, look into people's vehicles. Um, it's very non-intrusive. But there are some obvious signs that we look for. Um, that middle picture would be a good one, right? They they have the firewood stacked up, um, <clears throat> and they may have Massachusetts plates or out-of-state plates, and they're headed north. You know, we're at the Kennebunk Service Plaza. Um, so we would approach them, ask them about their trip, where they're going. You know, completely voluntary, um, completely uh, non-intrusive, but in in 99.9% .9 of people are very uh, compliant. Um, I don't think I've had somebody that was non-compliant yet. So, <clears throat> so this is what we're looking for as a main forest service when we set up these details. So we got some current quarantines going on. Um, obviously the Hot button issue right now is the emerald ash borer and probably the Asian longhorn beetle. But uh, what we're really looking for right now is the emerald ash borer. Um, <clears throat> these are some examples of what the other ones look look like. And if you have any specific questions when it comes to the invasive uh, species or anything, Mike Prizio is here as well to uh, add his. Uh, expert knowledge on too as well. So this is kind of our current EAB quarantine. Um, we don't want anything moving outside of the quarantine area to the non quarantine area. Um, we're trying to contain that as much as possible. It is a little bit of a uphill battle when it comes to that. Just there's just so much traffic means such a recreational state where everybody's going camping. You know it's vacation land so um it's it's really bad uh cumberland county york county southern oxford county is is really the worst parts of it <clears throat> i live in standish i'm pretty sure i got some on some of my ash trees as well <clears throat> so we really don't want anything traveling outside of that quarantine um and then especially we don't want anything coming from out of state um uh, if you see up north you know, Madawaska area, <clears throat> you'll see a quarantine area up there as well. And that's obviously coming over from the border in Canada. Um, we are pretty well surrounded. Massachusetts, New Hampshire, Quebec, New Brunswick, they all have EAB in some sort of, in some sort of quantity, you know. Um, 
you know, and that varies quite a bit. Massachusetts obviously is is quite heavy with the EAB, um, but once you get up into the more denser forests uh, in the softwood forest, then you you run out of it a little bit. But we are we are surrounded. Uh, <clears throat> we also have the emergency order uh, in effect, um, which is basically the quarantine. Uh, and then the lower end of the slide kind of shows you uh, where these counties are. So this is what uh, we look for for evidence. Um, <clears throat> as you can see in that middle picture is cut and split firewood. Uh, and that left picture um, is, you know, what what it looks like, you know, on a standing tree and on the right it. You know, you're looking for these holes um, that go into the ash wood. Uh, that's evidence of the EAB. Um, <clears throat> so when we see something like this in the middle picture, you know, when we're doing our details, you know, that's obviously a huge red flag. Um, one thing to mention is that we don't we don't really uh, discriminate between wood, so we kind of take it all. So if we see pine mixed in with hardwoods or maples and ash and oak and everything else it it doesn't really matter to us um you know it, it could still carry the invasives so we we will confiscate uh, whatever we can uh, if it's if it's obvious firewood so this is kind of some of the effects that we kind of see when um, this firewood moves past the quarantine areas, right? And then it spreads it to other areas. Naturally, these invasives will travel on their own just as nature um, progresses um, through their own means. But obviously hitching a ride on the tailgate is a much quicker means for somebody to, for these invasives to spread. That middle picture, that aerial photo of the forest um, that's a good uh, picture to just indicate what kind of devastation these invasives can do to the to the local forests Maine such a heavily wooded state but we also rely on our logging industry so much that um, obviously dead standing um, wood lots are of no use and it will take a hit at on the industry uh, the logging industry, you know, the same industry that we represent as the main forest service. So the main forest service obviously has a huge um, interest in keeping these invasives out. The other part of it is, is that when these invasives come and inundate these, these uh, stands, you know, then you have dead standing uh, forest, which um, is a fire hazard. So, um, you know, it increases the risk for wildfires, and that's something that also we have a high interest in. Um, so, <clears throat> all right, so this is uh, the law that um, when it pertains to the emergency order in the quarantine. So the commissioner uh, can set up the quarantine uh, for any dangerous plant disease or insect infestation. Uh, to prevent any sort of spread of uh, these invasives. So the commissioner has that discretion to create this quarantine. And as a penalty to the quarantine, uh, as you can see at the bottom at 2303, it's a civil violation. So it's something that forest rangers can write a ticket for and then you know, it goes on to explain the penalty a little bit more. So a fine of not less than a hundred dollars, not more than a thousand. So depending on uh, the offense, you know, maybe it's a little bit more egregious and it's somebody that we've been, we've warned in the past or been chasing, um, maybe that penalty will go up more towards the thousand dollars. And typically when we're doing these details though, um, we're just giving them warnings. It is a violation of the law, so we do put it into our system into Spillman, um, but that makes it easier for us in the future. 
where we can type their name in and then we can see if they've been warned in the past and they have and they'll most likely end up with a ticket. Um, but this is the law that we would use to enforce this quarantine. So what can you do to help? You know, obviously do not move firewood, even within state, you know, um, we don't really want uh, firewood to move within state, just burn it, burn it where you buy it or where you produce it. So be vigilant, look for contaminated firewood and trees, you know, maybe in your backyard, you might start looking a little bit deeper into, you know, maybe that tree's dying. Maybe I need to take a closer look at that. Maybe it's an invasive or some other environmental factor that's killing these trees around here. Buy local firewood, buy it where you burn it. Um, you're supporting the local economy when you do that. Uh, you're also, you know, you're also curbing this uh, spread of the invasives as well. So I know where I live, there's firewood stands and campsite, you know, campgrounds all around me. And, you know, a lot of times it's a Boy Scout troop or, or maybe uh, just uh, some kids trying to make a couple bucks. So just uh, buy it where you burn it. Um, educate your friends on moving firewood and pests. You know, a lot of us have out of state family and friends or even in state family and friends and they might, know, might, might not know about this quarantine. So obviously we've, the department's put in a big effort to try and uh, get the word out there, but you know, I've literally confiscated firewood underneath a don't move firewood sign at the rest area in Kennebunk. So um, we do our part, but, um, you know, we need help as well. And then you can report suspected out of state firewood movement to the main forest service. Uh, you can do that through various means. Um, you can do that through the Facebook page. You can do that through our dispatch. You can do that through, uh, the website so there's there's various means to do that all it, all it really is is a google search and and you can you can look that up and then again this is our contact us for more information you know regarding um <clears throat> where you need to go in order to report these um out of state firewood moves or firewood moves uh within state and outside of the quarantine so um, that concludes my presentation. I will take any questions if anyone has any. I know I'm kind of preaching to the choir a little bit here. So um, I, a lot of you guys uh, are well aware of the don't move firewood in the quarantine. So is there any questions uh, out there for me? All right, Mike, uh, do you have anything to add uh, as far as quarantine goes and invasives? Thanks, Eric. Um, well, yeah, I was just going to in between here. You know, I think we just have one uh, attendee. So, Alexis, uh, if you do have anything that you're specifically interested in us covering, please let us know. We can uh, we can fine tune this for you. Um, otherwise, I do have a, a, a slideshow and I can uh, just uh, share a few slides. I won't go through the whole thing. It's a long talk, but uh, share some pictures and some stories and stuff. So, so yeah, I'll just flip through some stuff really quick. And uh, yeah, I'll just talk a little bit more about those quarantines. And yeah, we're glad that the Rangers are one of the uh, the many lines of defense for uh, preventing the unwanted move of forest pests and, and firewood and other forestry products. So, you know, uh, a little bit more about these laws, they basically set up a one-way door. So we have what we consider regulated areas, which is where we find a pest, then we have non-regulated areas. So those are, you know, considered to be pest free. So you can take material from a pest free area and move it into an area that already has the pest because that's not doing any harm. But again, um, the big um, risk here is taking anything from a regulated area and accidentally or intentionally moving it into a non-regulated area. And so, uh, as Eric mentioned, you know, the forest industry is uh, is huge here in Maine. It's a vital part of our economy. So. Um, one thing I, I like to point out is is this door is not always shut, um, you know, and we uh, we can move things safely and smartly to allow you know certain aspects of the forest industry to continue to operate as they need, and uh, you know a lot of that just requires 
using the, uh, you know, an insect's biology to our advantage and stuff like that. So um, we can do a lot of stuff in the winter that we can't do during the summer to keep the, the flow of wood moving. So we do that with uh, a lot of different styles of, uh, of legal agreements, compliance agreements, et cetera. So, um, yeah, folks should just be aware that we can uh, we can get around uh, these these rules and regulations, you know, properly uh, with with certain agreements and stuff. So, um, yeah, on the topic of EAB. So, uh, you know, this kind of just speaks to the spread of EAB. It started in, in Michigan in 2002. Uh, well, that's where it was detected for the first time. But this is an insect that only moves a couple miles on its own naturally. And so in the course of about 20 years, you can see the distribution of emerald ash borer in the, you know, North America, or at least the United States and that map on the left. So obviously, you know, that's not natural movement. That's all been aided, you know, whether again, intentionally or uh, accidentally by, by human movements. And, you know, obviously things can spread around locally, but you see some really big jumps, you know, out to, you know, central Texas, this uh, South Dakota infestation was, you know, way far removed, Denver, Colorado, and it's not on this slide yet, but we even have EAB in Oregon now. So, so you know, the human aspect of, of the spread of invasive species, especially in thing like firewood is really, you know, it's, it's a true story, unfortunately. Um, we looked at these regulatory boundaries. So again, I just want to, um, I'll get to it after this, but I'll, uh, I'll talk a little bit about the biology of EAB quick and why, you know, it's such a risk in firewood and show some size and symptoms, but then I'll show you how some of this movement works. Um, and so, yeah, as far as EAB is concerned, uh, it, it exists mostly beneath the bark of, of an ash tree. So uh, the vast majority of the life cycle takes place totally concealed, totally hidden. Um, people rarely ever see the adults. Um, exit holes are also not so frequently encountered, but um, yeah, that's why this is such a risk in firewood, because you can take a piece of ash firewood, split it up, and have no idea what's going on below the bark here. So the larvae feed there um, for a year or two, depending on how well established an infestation is. And so, and they can survive for really long periods of time. You know, they do overwinter. So, you know, you could cut something down one summer, you know, and then move it someplace and have stuff emerging the next year. So people kind of lose track of, you know, uh, you know, that's not enough of a seasoning period to eliminate stuff. And the only real way to, you know, eliminate insects from some of this firewood is is uh, heat treating, you know, and not just kiln drying, you know, actually, you know, elevated heat for uh, duration of time to kill everything within. So. Um, you know, again, this illustrates, you know, an EAB tree. So this one you can actually see on the left, um, there is some woodpecker activity that would cue you into that. But, you know, if you take away that woodpecker activity, you know, that's normal bark on a tree, so to speak. And then, you know, this is what can be going on underneath. And again, if your firewood is still, you know, at the right age or whatever, where it's holding on to its bark, you know, you would probably never know this was going on below. So, um, Again, you know, and this is uh, this is something to keep in mind of, you know, especially here in Maine and other places, you know, as these ash trees are killed by emerald ash borer, that obviously makes them great firewood. You know, ash is a great firewood to begin with, and, you know, people are keen to, you know, if they have to cut down a tree for firewood, it might as well be ash. So as these trees are dying from EAB, a lot of people are resorting to that. It's becoming a primary firewood in places. So that's why it's so important that, yes, if your tree was, killed by EAB, it's okay to take it down and use it for firewood, but you have to do it there. You don't want to move this five miles, 10 miles, especially from state to state. You know, uh, we have a lot of camp owners that might live in, in other places. And, you know, you certainly don't want to bring this to your camp property and uh, lose all your trees there if you have ash at your camp property. So, you know, again, just illustrating, you know, there's a, you know, a perfectly looking you know, ash from the outside on the right there. But if you peel that bark back, all that activity is going on, you know, under your nose, under the bark, and you might not well know it. So um, these are just some of the galleries for emerald ash borer. So again, if you are looking at firewood or trees, um, you know, if you get a load of firewood or if you're processing firewood and you see stuff like this, this is what we'd like to know about at the insect and disease lab. So these are the 
classic galleries of uh, Emerald Ash Borer, you know, and you saw a bunch of this in the firewood pictures that Eric showed, you know, so those S-shaped galleries and stuff like that. So it's really important. Um, you might encounter the larvae too when you're processing firewood. So this is what they look like there um, when they're mature, you know, a little bit over an inch long. They have bell-shaped segments and, uh, you know, especially important. There are some other larvae that live in our ash that are native and harmless, um, but EAB has these two little black, uh, you know, protrusions on the end there. So that's really diagnostic for an EAB larvae. And again, you don't have to be an expert in that. All you have to do is be able to take a picture and send it to us and we will tell you what you're working with. So, and again, D-shaped exit holes. So not something you see in the wild, uh, but something you might see if you're handling a lot of firewood, stuff like that. So. Let's get through this stuff. <clears throat> so again, um, Eric shared this map. You know, these are what the regulatory zones look like right now. So um, this is kind of pertaining to log movement and stuff. We have a little bit more <clears throat> freedom of movement with that. But, you know, this just goes to show, you know, if you're in a non-regulated area, you can move stuff around freely from point A to point B. Um, you can move stuff into regulated zones from non-regulated zones, so these green arrows. Um, but if you're ever taking anything out, you know, of the regulated zone in the form of logs, you need a legal agreement with the Maine Forest Service. So firewood is less lenient, and so you can see on this map here, you know, there really are no exceptions. We don't do this. Um, you know, firewood is not to leave these regulated areas. Um, for any you know non-regulated areas of Maine, you know I have this arrow in green with okay in quotes. You know again, legally you can do this. Um, best management practices say don't do it or do it as you know infrequently as possible or move firewood the shortest distance as possible. Again, that's that's all coming back to the buy local, burn local, use local. So um, yeah, and then here's just a few stories. Uh, Again, you know, this is one from two or three years ago, uh, but this is again your classic, you know, um, hitch mounted um, storage thing there full of firewood, you know, and uh, you can't see it here. This is an Ohio place. So this person came all the way from Ohio. And um, as Eric also mentioned, yeah, Maine is not as, as thoroughly heavily hit by a lot of these pests as other places. So, uh, you know, knowing what's going on in places like, you know, Massachusetts, Connecticut, New York, Ohio, you know, this is immediate red flag. <clears throat> and sure enough, this is all ash firewood. You can see EAB galleries right here. So, you know, this is something right here confiscated in Maine. Um, and then, yeah, Eric also mentioned, you know, the Rangers have been doing a lot of great work with the uh, firewood outreach at the, uh, um the rest areas and stuff like that so uh you know they did confiscate a lot of firewood coming from out of state um over memorial day and uh you know this is another example so this wasn't actually at one of those events but this was also memorial day um this year so a state trooper actually saw a trailer full of firewood and i can't remember what the plate said but anyways it came to you know pass that this uh this firewood came from pennsylvania so again pennsylvania is a state with a lot of problems and so thoroughly overrun with emerald ash borer and yeah plenty of galleries but this one you know this beetle was dead but you can see <clears throat> that's a d-shaped emergence hole right there and this beetle was decapitated but you know we pulled that out and those are the the bright green wings of an emerald ash borer adult that was ready to emerge so uh fortunately yeah, nothing alive in this but you know this stuff can easily happen like i said they can survive a long time and yeah, I'll mention, you know, uh, it's not just Maine doing stuff like this. So Maine has an exterior firewood ban on all out of state firewood. So does New Hampshire. You know, a Mainer can't, you know, bring their firewood to New Hampshire and, you know, anywhere else coming into New Hampshire. So we're we're not the only people that are concerned about this. And, you know, there's a lot of federal regulations, you know, Asian longhorn beetle was talked about. So there's a potentially active population in Worcester, Massachusetts, you know, so not far away. And so, you know, that's why we really have to be careful with all our visitation to the state of Maine from uh, from other states that have, uh, you know, these these really damaging insects and uh, and other forest pests. So, um, yeah, I mentioned this before. So, again, you can kind of see that um, EAB has made some huge jumps. So they're still trying to figure out what happened here in Oregon. But uh, this is 2022 EAB was found in Oregon. So whether or not 
you know, this is something that got transported from the eastern U.S. and got established here or potentially, you know, another new, uh, you know, infestation coming from overseas. Um, Emerald ash borer is native to, you know, northeastern Asia. And so whether or not this came through a port there and is a, uh, a whole new, you know, introduction into North America, they're doing the genetics on that now. But, um, yeah, we'll, we'll see what they find out. So... And then, yeah, that's what I really have for EAB. I won't probably focus on any of this other stuff, but yeah, just to be mindful that there are, you know, a whole list of uh, quarantine pests here in Maine. Um, and, you know, if there's any questions about any of that stuff, we're always there to answer those questions. So that's all I really have to, to add, I think. All right, thank you. Appreciate the feedback. Is there any other questions? I suppose I can I could talk. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess I have two kind of questions. Well, not really questions, but um, statements. So I'm in Somerset County. <clears throat> I deal a lot with uh, forest landowners in Somerset County, and they're all asking me like what they should be doing with their ash trees and so now i see we are in some of that quarantine somerset county now is but um as far as places where ash is not located yet like should they be considering harvesting them or should they just be leaving them and see what happens in the future and it's not really the scope of this this meeting but i just thought i'd throw it out there um as to what you guys might be thinking that's about as far as ash management that's a totally fine question. And so, um, yeah, you know, one thing, one thing that's really important that people sometimes, you know, don't understand with these maps. So, uh, you know, there's a, there's a big regulatory area, <clears throat> but that does not mean that that regulatory area is a hundred percent infested with EAB. So when we find EAB in a new point and we make a new boundary, we have to buffer it because EAB is so hard to find, you know, there's a good chance, you know, it's not just right at that epicenter, you know, it's probably, you know, within a few miles. And so we, <clears throat> we hedge our bets and, you know, say, okay, it could be here. So that's, that's where that regulatory, you know, zone gets assigned to. And so that's why, you know, Southern Somerset is now in that regulatory zone. I don't believe there is a single instance of EAB in Somerset County yet. Um, but anyways, you know, what we're recommending for people you know, is, is just to keep an eye on this, you know, like, and have a plan. So there's really no need to start harvesting ahead of time, <clears throat> but there's no harm in, you know, having a forester, you know, knowing some loggers, you know, being ready to act um, when EAB shows up nearby. Cause you know, if, if left to spread on its own, you know, EAB might not be, you know, into a lot of these places for another 10 years, you know, and that's a lot of growth, you know, if you're going to try to get some, uh, some value out of your ash trees or something, you know, 10 more years of volume is, is nothing, you know, to, to turn your nose up at. So, uh, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's my recommendation. Know what you have, you know, get that inventory, you know, whether you know it, if it's, you know, simple or getting a forester, um, and then have that plan to cut when EAB shows up, you know, usually we recommend, you know, if it's within five or 10 miles. So, you know, we release these, uh, <clears throat> these maps constantly as we learn the new whereabouts of EAB and stuff like that. So just, you know, sign up for the EAB newsletters, mailing lists and stuff like that. You'll know when it gets close and then it's time to, you know, pick up that conversation with your forester and your logger and stuff like that. So. Thank you. Yeah, that was that was really helpful. And that's more or less what we have been telling them. So that's nice that it's been in line. Um, yeah. And then and then second on a more personal note. So I uh, Minsk out Hegan and then I frequently travel up uh, to like the Forks area on the weekends. And so I don't know where that line falls um, in Somerset County. But I mean, that is that's basically what we've got going on here is people traveling up 201 to go camp to go to camp or to go camping or to go on a, an excursion and then throughout my entire drive up 201 it's people selling firewood so i just didn't know how you guys were dealing with that or if that's like in your purview because that's just like news to me i'm like well i'm in that exact route might be that boundary line um i'm not sure yeah Mo moscow is the is the end of the boundary zone on 201 there so uh yeah well i mean so again it's not a perfect system so i mean those those local firewood uh 
dealers, you know, selling stuff up there. Now, now this has just changed. You know, they shouldn't be like buying firewood in Moscow technically and bringing it up to the forks. Um, obviously, you know, that does probably happen because there's only so many people to keep an eye on that stuff. But, um, you know, that's, that's kind of, you know, more ideal than, you know, something coming from York County and going all the way up there. So, um, right. you know, we do a lot of monitoring for EAB as well. So, uh, you know, we do have that route heavily covered with, with traps and stuff like that. So we do monitor, you know, all the regulated areas and beyond. So, you know, it's kind of, kind of what we can, what we can do in a realistic setting. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Hopefully, you know, I don't know. It's hard. Eric, what do you think? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's, it's hard. It's hard to educate. It's hard to push the narrative out. Um, but, I mean, I, I'm mostly down here in the quarantine area, so it, it pretty much anything moving down here is a no-go, so... Um, a lot of out-of-state stuff so i'm sure the rangers up in that area know those lines and yeah and have that relationship already set so that i know my area and i know the bingham area ranger knows his area as well so um you can be sure that he's looking out for that sort of thing as well Nice. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, guys. Yeah, that's all I have. But that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's only so much you can do, but at least you're putting putting the effort in, you know, to at least slow the spread. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think the big push that we've done a good job on is the out of state stuff, um, because like like we've been saying, I mean, New Hampshire is annihilated from EAB, Massachusetts annihilated, New York annihilated, like all of southern New England, you know, is just absolutely annihilated. So, you know, with all the signage and the, you know, um you know inspections and stuff like that i think people are starting to get that more and more um you know there is a spirit in maine that's that's sometimes hard to control <laughs> but uh no i mean i'm i'm always pleasantly surprised i mean uh, i get i get a lot of calls you know about people ask you know asking like stuff like that like hey you know i'm, I'm heading up to the forks can i can i do this you know and and sometimes it's a simple matter of you know they don't know and just have to say no unfortunately not you know like go buy your firewood up there and they're like, oh okay no problem you know so uh so yeah you know there's there's a whole a whole spectrum but a lot of people are uh are aware and uh you know there are a lot of people that you know do know their firewood species and can self-regulate a little bit and i think they do you know there are some people that don't but uh yeah i mean it's i think i think we've got you know the the best uh scenario we can probably have um you know with with what we have to work with so Thanks, guys. Appreciate it. Thank you. <clears throat> All right. Uh, looks like we're the only ones left in here. Um, this will conclude this uh, Forestry Friday talk. Thank you for attending and have a good day. Thanks, Eric. Thank you. Bye bye.